So this session is uh, on structural racialization, theory and practice in Illinois. Um, the first thing that I'd like to do is introduce our speakers. Um, all the way on my left, your right, is Kate Walsh. She is the Director of Housing Justice and Litigation at the Shriver Center. Uh, her work is focused on advancing racial justice on behalf of and in support of communities of color to challenge systemic and structural racialization. Um, she's been lead counsel in numerous federal and state court cases, as well as Title VI and Title VIII uh, administrative complaints. Uh, then we have Candace Moore, who is a staff attorney with the Education Equity Project at Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. Um, her work is focused on organizing legal advocacy resources to address disparate discipline and barriers to enrollment for students throughout Chicago and its surrounding communities. And closest to me is Alise Citrini. Uh, Alise is a supervisory attorney with LAF, uh, with the Medical Legal Partnership Project. Um, she works with medical providers at Erie Family Home Center and Loyola University School of Law to use legal services to address social determinants of health in some of Chicago's most health-challenged neighborhoods. Um, my name is Jim Brady. I am a supervisory attorney with LAF in the Consumer Practice Group. And I am also uh, the current chair of our uh, Civil Rights Task Force. All right. That works. OK, so our agenda today is we're going to, since we started late, I'm going to go real quick through the four types of racism so we can get right to kind of the meat of the presentation. Uh, we'll look at specific examples of systemic racism in three areas, housing, education, and health. And then we're going to open it up for discussion uh, with the panel members and hopefully with you all to talk about um, how we can use these examples from these cases and our panel's experiences to address structural racialization in your work um, that you all are doing every day. Uh, so we're going to define a couple terms first. First, race um, is not really a biological uh, reality. It's kind of a construction that, that we have created uh, over social and, and, and political manners. Um, racism then needs to be understood in, in that context, that it's an ideology and process in which inequalities are inherent in a wider social system. Um, an example is that when we look at poverty, which is really just the state of not having enough money or resources to meet your needs, that it has been racialized in the United States, that frequently uh, people see poverty as being more of people of color when in fact that's not true, that when you look at the statistics, there are more whites in poverty than there are people of color. Okay, so the four types of racism. Um, we have internal, interpersonal, institutional, and then structural. When we talk about internal, what we are talking about is something that lies within all of us. It's, it's, it's individual to each of us. Um, these are our own private beliefs and biases about race and racism, which are then influenced by the culture in which we live. Uh, it can take many different forms. Uh, which could be racial prejudice towards another racial group. It could be internalized oppression, where the negative beliefs about oneself by, by people of color. Or it could be internalized privilege, where someone who is white feels that they are superior to someone of color. Interpersonal, which is the type of racism that most of us are most, most familiar with because we see it more often. Um, and this occurs when there is interaction between people. And these are biases that occur when individuals interact with others and then their own private racial beliefs affect their public interactions. So examples of this are racial violence, hate crimes, racial slurs. Systemic occurs within our institutions and systems of power. And it is the unfair practices that 
of particular institutions, for example, schools or workplaces, that routinely produce racially inequitable outcomes for people of color and advantages for white people. Uh, an example of this is a school system that concentrates people of color in the most overcrowded schools, the least challenging classes, and the least qualified teachers. This frequently results in higher dropout rates and disciplinary rates compared with those of white students. And then lastly, systemic. Um, this is, well, structural, sorry. Um, is racial bias amongst these institutions and across society. And it's cumulative, it compounds um, these effects. And an example of this is uh, how people of color are depicted in the media, right? So frequently um, they, they will be portrayed as criminals or thugs. The term thug is used a lot when, when um, looking at people of color in the media. And this can have the effect of that then those people are treated uh, with suspicion when they're shopping or just driving through a neighborhood or an employment or, or anything else. Okay. So racialization then is influenced by these, you know, it, it's influenced by our history, our past. It's influenced by our current culture, media, how things are, are portrayed. And then it's further compounded by how our institutions, our systems of power and policies and ideology then kind of compound those effects uh, much more broadly. Okay. Um, then we have implicit bias, which when we do our trainings on this within LAF, we start with an implicit bias training and then we do the, the racialization training. And the point of that is to realize that biases are pervasive. People are unaware that they exist until they start to see it, until they look for it and then recognize it. And an example of this that we have here, I, I don't know if you can see it, but um, these are two news stories that came out after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. And in the top one, um, an African-American woman is floating through the water with her belongings, and they use the term looting to refer to her activity. You have almost an identical situation. There's a woman, uh, now it's a white woman in the water, and now she's referred to as finding bread or finding the things that she needs to survive. Okay, so I went fast through that because I really want to get the, the, the panelists a chance to talk about their work. Um, so if we have any questions later, we can, we can kind of work those into our, our conversation. Um, so our first panelist is going to be Kate Walsh from Shriver Center, and she's going to talk about her work in the housing area. However you want to do it, yeah. if you want. And then you can just drive yourself. Yeah. Oh. So I'm going to talk about uh, a few of our recent cases uh, and how we've challenged structural racialization. I'm also going to sort of talk about the tools that we've used to get to that point of bringing a case. Um, I'm going to skip just in the interest of time. So this is a case that's been in the news quite a bit. It's sort of been in the crosshairs of the uh, Illinois governor's race. Everybody needs to show up in Cairo. Um, so what we did in this case uh, is really show the history of what was happening in Cairo. We filed a federal civil rights case uh, last year uh, with Hugh Sokol, uh, a civil rights firm in Chicago, uh, to challenge the fact that we had found that the housing authority was still segregating its public housing by race. And then they were failing to maintain the predominantly African-American developments. In fact, they had separate break rooms for the maintenance employees. White employees had one break room, African-American employees had the other. Only African-American employees attended to the African-American developments, which was the majority um, of the housing. So there were two African-American employees assigned to those developments. So we could have filed just with those atrocious facts alone. But instead, what we did 
is we looked to the history of Cairo itself and, and the long history of racial strife and racial animus within that community in terms of rather than integrating their swimming pools in the 1970s, they filled them with cement. Right? They, they denied employment um, at all levels of city government to African Americans. Uh, there was a brigade of people called the White Hats. They were um, an offshoot of the Klan. Um, and these were uh, young men and, and women who were part of the white power structure in Cairo. Um, one of the stories that came out in the depositions that were taken of our clients uh, was of our client Audrey Tabor, who was part of a civil rights group responding to the White Hats called the United Front, where they were challenging the presence of uh, Klan members um, and neo-Nazis coming into their town intent on maintaining racial segregation at all systems within Cairo. And Ms. Tabor was part of the United Front um, as an 18-year-old was actually arrested for uh, allegedly assaulting a white woman who was part of the White Hats and um, fought uh, as part of that movement for years and then left Cairo sort of in disgust um, and came back uh, about five years ago. Uh, she wanted to come back to her historic community. She also was in need of affordable housing so she was told she had to meet with the executive director of the housing authority and, uh, and have an interview with him before she would be admitted to the housing. Imagine her surprise when she goes into the interview and she sees James Wilson, who's at the bottom with the sunglasses, the white gentleman with the white shirt. Uh, he was the head of the White Hats, and he was now running the housing authority. Uh, and uh, she also recalls Mr. Wilson and, and his uh, uh, crew, which included at the time uh, the president of the board of the Housing Authority of Alexander County, this is 2015, um, shooting into the public housing development at the time and her um, running into the bathroom and throwing all the kids into the bathtub so that they could be safe. Um, so this is how far it can go and how unchecked it can go and how, as advocates, you have to be willing to tell that story and to go back into history. Because even if we didn't have all the evidence of intent in 2015, we had historical evidence of outrageous discrimination and, we had, and that they had been caught twice Prior to our, us filing a lawsuit on the segregation of public housing, they had been caught twice segregating their public housing before. There was a history of discrimination there that we could tell. It was also that we knew that the town was complicit in the take of Alexander County Housing Authority, that the funds that should have gone to maintain the housing of the African-American residents in McBride and Elmwood instead went to town festivals, went to uh, other events within the town, went to golden parachutes for members of the board and other employees of the town. They used this, this housing authority as their piggy bank, and we told that story with our client narrative about what that did to them. The next case uh, is different. This is a case involving the community of Fairmont, which is in Will County. Um, we filed in December of 2016 a Title VI complaint with the Federal Highway uh, Administration Division of Civil Rights. Um, you can all ask me why I did that in the new era that we're in at another point. But we did. Um, so the what we are challenging, what our clients, the Fairmark Community Partnership Group, is challenging is the decision of the Will County Department of Transportation to put a four-lane highway through their town. 
this is a predominantly minority community, uh, low to moderate income homeowners and renters. Um, again, we could have stopped there with that challenge. We could have talked about the failure to provide uh, meaningful community input and the failure to consider the impact um, uh, of that decision on the community. But we also told the story of the absolute neglect of Fairmont over the years by Will County and the state of Illinois. They didn't even have sidewalks in their community until 2015, even though 90% of the elementary school children walked to school. For years, they had begged for sidewalks. And when I talked to them on the phone in advance of being retained, they talked with pride about finally being able to get these sidewalks after a, a years, you know, five or six years of campaigning to get the sidewalks. When we went out there and met with them, the sidewalk that they had won is about the length of this table. Um, so they had, this was how little respect uh, and power the community had been given. And that Will County did not meet with them prior to making this decision, but they met, as we, as we told the story in our complaint, they met with the white communities. They heard from the white communities. They actually held more meetings than they needed to under federal law with white communities. And when white communities said, we don't want this highway to cut through our town or part of our town, um, or even in the case, we don't want it to interfere uh, with a dragonfly preserve, Will County said, that's fine. We, we won't do that. We'll move it in another direction. And so the proposal then was to cut it directly through the center of Fairmount and to divide that community and to, to force these school children to somehow cross a four-lane highway on their way to school. When Fairmont demanded a meeting repeatedly because the residents organized and mobilized to, to bring attention to this crisis, Will County met with them. But the first thing they said is, it's too late. We'll hear you, but it's too late. So just tell us what you want otherwise, but this highway is coming uh, to your town. Um, and so you have to tell the bigger story. You ethically have to look at every aspect of why this has happened. If you only look for the highway, or you only look for the conditions in the housing, you're really missing the bigger issues at play when it comes to structural racialization. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, Kate. Um, Elise is now going to talk about uh, health disparities. Elise? So um, I'm actually not going to talk about specific cases that we worked on, but more the general um, structures and institutions and systems that we see at play. And we're going to—I'm going to look specifically at um, some statistics about health disparities in Illinois, and particularly, uh, and then how we're trying to address those, particularly in Chicago with two MLPs. Um, so here are some statistics in Illinois on racial disparities that are surrounding some really important health indicators such as life expectancy, birth weight, infant mortality, and food insecurity. Um, so if you happen to be an Illinoisan that's born uh, here, you are more than twice as likely to have a low birth weight child if you are black compared to white, and, um, and also um, infant mortality is much higher for African-American children than for white children. Additionally, households of color with children, um, that this statistic is for Illinois, or rather for the United States, um, you're much more likely, twice as likely to be food insecure if you are a community of color than if you are white. Um, and then life expectancy overall in Illinois, there is a large, there's a six year, about a six year disparity of how long you're going to live just based on your racial identity. Um, if we look a little bit closer to the Chicago community, we've got additional social roots of health disparities, such as poor housing conditions. If you live in poor housing conditions, you're much more likely to be affected by things like lead poisoning, much more likely to be affected by things like asthma, 
or, or even just injury from falling or, uh, you know, you know, falling from a hole in your floor or, you know, not having adequate, you know, adequate conditions for which to live. Um, additionally, lack of income, such as from public benefits or disability, can cause other health uh, consequences, such as hunger and malnutrition, low birth weight, developmental delays, um, and behavioral and mental health uh, situations as well. Um, and so, and if we look just particularly at life expectancy in disparity in Chicago, a short train ride down the Green Line, which maybe some of you took today, from the Gold Coast, your uh, life expectancy is about 85 years. And if you take that train out to Garfield Park, that goes down to 72 years. Um, and then if you take that Green Line down uh, to the south side, it goes down to 69 years. Um, and we can ask, you know, what does that really mean? Why is that the case? Because if I were to put up another map on top of this showing um, healthcare resources, there actually is a wealth of healthcare resources um, on the west side of Chicago. There are a lot of teaching institutions, federally qualified health centers. So it's not necessarily a lack of um, healthcare institutions that are causing these disparities. Um, so what is the answer to that question? What is the cause of these disparities? Um, and I'm just going to look at one more very quickly before I answer. Um, lead poisoning is another area that has been in the news a lot recently. And if we look at these three maps, um, it, the story becomes a little bit more apparent as to what's happening. Um, <clears throat> the, the top... Uh, yellow and or kind of orangish colored map shows the poverty rate, the highest concentrations of the, the poorest people in uh, Chicago. This is Cook County, actually. Uh, no, yeah, this is Chicago. Um, so it shows the highest concentrations of poverty are the same kind of overlapped area where there are the highest concentration of African American and Latino um, you know, uh, community members. And then if we look at the map that shows lead poisoning, the highest concentration of uh, positive tests for lead poisoning. For, so the CDC says that six micrograms of lead per deciliter of blood. And this is a test that's mandated every time a child before the age of one has to be tested uh, for lead. Um, so we're getting those positive hits. And every positive hit for lead gets reported to the Department of Public Health. So we have really good statistics on lead poisoning in Illinois and in Chicago. Um, so we're seeing that the areas of high hits for lead poisoning are also the same areas with the highest concentration of poverty, and they're also the same areas with the highest concentration of African American and Latino residents. Um, okay, so um, so how what is what is the answer then? What is the cause for these um, disparities in health? Um, one of the theories is that there are these issues called social determinants of health. And that means that everything in your community, your education, your access to things like fresh, healthy foods, um, all of those things are influencing your health. And the bigger structures that we're working in affect the um, access and availability of communities of color to those positive health indicators. Uh, things such as um, safe and close by playgrounds might affect your ability to exercise more, to, to, to walk to school. If you don't have, if you have a highway going through from your home until where you get to school, you're not really going to be able to walk to school. Um, so you're not going to have as much physical activity. If you don't, if you live in a food desert, so your uh, access to a nearby grocery store uh, is a 20-minute uh, L ride or, you know, a 20-minute car ride and you don't have a car, uh, that's going to affect your ability to eat fresh, healthy foods. Um, so that is why we're seeing some, uh, that is a theory as to why we're seeing health disparities. Even though these communities might have access to a doctor, um, it, that is not the only piece of the health disparity puzzle. So one of the ways that we're able to address these social determinants is through a medical legal response. Um, we work with, we collaborate with different stakeholders in related fields, so medical providers, public health specialists, and community organizations that help individuals as well as communities and populations. Um, so we work uh, with this interdisciplinary partnership to try to address the whole patient or the whole you know, community that we're working with. 
we're able to identify those health harming legal issues before they become critical and engage in uh, community and preventative lawyering and advocacy. Uh, we can also identify some systemic issues and uh, engage in policy reform. I'll give you an example about what this looks like. I work with a medical legal partnership between LAF, a federally qualified health center in Chicago, and Loyola University Law School. Um, a provider was treating a pediatric patient and she diagnosed the patient as being lead poisoned. Um, she referred the patient to the medical legal partnership and uh, for assistance because the family was actually living in subsidized housing. So this is a person who's living in federally subsidized housing who is, her whole entire family was uh, being affected by lead poison. So your tax dollars were going to poison these children. Um, so the Chicago Housing Authority said that there were lots of lead hazards in the home and uh, they would move them to a house that was then, or housing that was then tested prior with the advocacy of the medical legal partnership partners. Um, then additionally, the law school was able to um, engage in policy work and they were able to um, they were able to work on the US, with the US Department of Housing and Urban Development and advocate for the Lead Safe Housing Kids Act of 2016. And so that was one example of a really great success story of a patient that was um, referred for one issue and we were able to address not just that one patient client's issue but uh, the larger community. Um, another reason, another way that MLP is a really great, exciting model to address the structural racism is that we are able to work with community partners that may have a closer tie to different populations that we're trying to prioritize. So these are some internal numbers from LAF uh, from the beginning of 2017 through early June. And you can see that the percentage of English-speaking population that we're able to that are able to access our services for whatever reason is fairly high, 91%. Um, whereas that's not really on parity with the English versus Spanish speaking population of Chicago and Cook County, which is the whole area that we're uh, trying to serve. Um, through the Erie MLP, we are able to reach about 42% of our uh, intake uh, patient clients are Spanish speaking only. So we know that we're, through this model, we're able to access those clients uh, more effectively, more efficiently, and um, you know we're able to improve the outreach and the community engagement that we're able to do through the MLP model. Thanks, Thanks Elise. Uh, Candice is now going to talk about her work in the area of education. Thank you. Um, and I'll warn you, I put made too many slides, so I'm going to go really fast. Um, and try to get everything covered, but if you want me to go back at any point during the questions, I'm happy to do so. So I'm going to fly through this, um, but uh, I work on our education equity project where our, we protect and promote access to education, um, and we do it in these three ways, individual representation, advocacy for systems change, and empowering communities. What I want to spend time talking about today is really sort of dissecting uh, this construct of the school to prison pipeline and talking about how we sort of think about it and how we overlay some of these theories around structural uh, racialization into how we think about the work and then also uh, in turn how we show up in the work. So I sort of made this pipeline to give you a nice visual. Mm -hmm. I work a lot with young people, so I like lots of colors and visuals, so get ready. Um, um, but uh, so one of the first things we can think about is school push out practices and these are going to be the practices where students are being removed from the school or being removed from the classroom whether it's through suspensions, expulsions, um, sometimes in school suspensions, not being able to access classroom time for uh, what, what, what looks like behavior issues. And, and um, I think when you're talking about behavior, you're definitely uh, seeing a lot of interpersonal action, uh, interactions, um, uh, how we, like power struggles between students and staff and adults. I, I should also add that I think this is something that we look at through an institutional lens as well. 
Um, but we use a lot of data and we're looking at individual schools, a big school district that we look at, also in the Chicago Public Schools. And so we're constantly looking at that data and trying to identify different trends that we're seeing. But so this is in the 15, 16 school year, 329 students were expelled. But which for Chicago Public Schools, when you think about how many students that ha they have, uh, I think like 400,000, 329 doesn't seem like that much. But then when you really break down that data, just 3% of the schools accounted for 62% of all the expulsions. Um, and, so, and, and so really being able to drill that down and talk about what's going on with these particular schools, where those schools are at. Um, then we looked at the data another way, and we looked at um, uh, charter schools, because the expulsion numbers did include charter schools. And so we just said, okay, what are the schools that are expelling the highest rates of students? So we looked at expulsions per 100 students. And let's just put them on a list. Uh, 19 of these 20 schools were charter schools, um, and 10 of these schools were part of one particular network. Um, and so that just gave us a lens in which to really orient our advocacy to think about what kind of impact we could have, what kind of conversations we could have about what was really going on. Um, and also we looked at in the suspension, so when we get the CPS data, we can get uh, expulsions that include charter schools. However, when we look at suspensions, we're only looking at the district-run school, district run schools. But again, just a very, very small number, just 3% of schools accounted for 20% of all the suspensions. 100% of these schools were on the south and west sides of Chicago, mostly black and Hispanic communities, and 16 schools suspended at least a third of their students. Um, and so this allows us to have conversations with Chicago Public Schools when they talk about all of, and they are doing lots of great reform, but where, is, where, where are the resources going? Are they targeting the right schools? Clearly you could target a small percentage of the schools and have an incredible impact on the overall issue. Um, the other thing when we're talking about the uh, school to prison pi pipeline is implicit bias and stereotypes. And I think here, when we think about those four levels of racism, to me things that get implicated are uh, internalized racism and interpersonal racism a lot. Um, so there is lots of research happening right now around implicit bias, and so uh, luckily we're at able to tap into a lot of the research that's going on across the country about implicit bias, especially in the area of school discipline. So where does uh, implicit bias show up in school discipline? So uh, the research suggests that it shows up in the in interpretation of subjective infractions. So these are going to be infra infractions like behavior, excessive noise, disrespect. These are really dependent on how the person is processing them. And when we talk about implicit biases, a person can be filtering their, their, their processing of what is disrespe disrespectful based off of their own experience. What's a loud noise? What's too loud for school? Right? Um, when is a student actually being disrespectful or um, is, uh, you know, saying something that you just aren't used to or something that you think is disrespectful but something that's sort of a co something that's very common in the community that they come from. And it's not to say that then you just accept the behavior, but do you teach it or do you spend time to really uh, bring students up to speed or are you just disciplining with the expectation that they should already know these things? Um, include, this includes dis disciplinary decisions, um, how much discipline will work for a student, um, what, what works for boys, what works for girls, what works for black students, what works for Hispanic students. We have all of these biases around what will work. Confirmation bias, you find trouble where you're looking for trouble. If all you're looking for is the boys on the playground, then you never see what's going on with the girls on the playground. And, and a lot of research suggests that they're doing just as many uh, things that would be considered infractions, but you're focused on the boys, so that's where you're going to find your things. And then teachers' expectations of student achievement. Um, and then there's a lot of research on what we can do to address our implicit biases. And one of the things that we're doing is trying to have some trainings with school administrators to bring out these conversations, to bring this research and this information to them, to talk about what's going on, how are we looking at our practices, how can we come up with different strategies for addressing uh, this work and reducing overall um, uh, some of the disparities that we see. There's also uh, system-wide disparate, uh, disparate outcomes, and to me this implicates that institutional and structural level of racism um, that Jim was pointing out earlier. 
And so here we're able to use data to really talk about how does this look across our city? How does this interact with the segregation that we understand um, Chicago to be, the segregated city we understand it to be? So here we took some data and said, where are the schools with the highest levels of expulsion? Um, and we just said, let's map them, right? Let's see where they sit on a map. And the blue uh, dots on, on that right map, on the, the map on the right, uh, that's your right, right? Okay. <laughs> it's always that thing. Um, so that, that blue map on the right, uh, that's where we just uh, pinpointed all the schools and uh, the s circles in blue represent charter schools, the circles in red represent district schools, and we said just where are they? And we uh, put it right next to a map that uh, outlines segregation uh, in Chicago. The blue represents African American, orange, Hispanic, green, uh, Asian, and uh, the pink reddish color, white. And it's pretty clear to see that when we're talking about expulsions, we're really talking about it being concentrated in areas that are predominantly black. So just being able to show this and use this as a, as a frame in which to talk about the issue and to talk about what's going on and then and, and in tandem where our solutions need to be um, becomes really important in our advocacy. Uh, I'm going to kind of fly through some of these, but we can look at them again in the questions. But this is just showing um, that uh, uh, just the, the level of disparity that we see when it comes to suspensions, who's getting suspended. Um, the red represents African-American students. The lighter blue is Hispanic. The darker blue is white. Um, and you can just see that as you, relative to district enrollment, it, when we look at in-school suspensions, out-of-school suspensions, and expulsions, um, it, it, it's like Pac-Man for black students with it getting larger and larger. Um, this has become really important as CPS has done some incredible work to reduce the numbers of suspensions that, and expulsions that are happening across the district. However, when we compare the, this type of graph with years prior, we see that disparities really aren't changing, right? And so that, that, that opens up another level of the conversation. It's great that we're reducing numbers, but how do we also try to get equity in, in how discipline is happening, which is another important question for us as advocates. Um, and this is just another one that um, shows some of the, uh, the dis what's happening with the district schools versus the charter schools to have that conversation. And it's not saying charters are always bad and district schools are always good, but let's have an honest conversation about what's happening and what, what the difference is and so that we can really uh, craft solutions around it. Um, and then there's also punitive culture and climate. And then, I mean, this could really just sort of hit all of the levels. Um, but how, how do you really grapple with that? And so one thing that we're doing um, with our organization is that we have worked with other attorneys, school psychologists, policy advocates, and community partners in this uh, network called the Transforming School Discipline Collaborative. We were really able to capitalize on a uh, a bill that was passed into law that was brought by community organi organizations, SB 100. Some of you might be familiar with it. But after the bill is won, after the law is passed, and the victory party is over, then the work begins towards implementation and how can we ensure that we are protecting the win, that we are really thinking hard and deep about how this will actually work for districts across the state. And we're able to do this much better and much more effectively when we work in partnership. Um, being able to really get very proximate with schools and come up with models and guidance and, and really push the state agency even to take a deeper look through our work. And these, this is a representation of all of the folks that sit at our collaborative. Um, some, you know, you're familiar with through the law, but um, uh, really just uh, trying to expand this idea of, of a collaborative effort. So um, that, that's sort of a high level of our work. I'm happy to answer more questions. Okay. Uh, thanks, Candice. Um, so now we're going to talk. Um, I have some pre-set questions for the panelists, and I think they have some for each other. Um, if we have questions from the audience, uh, I think the best way to do it might be just to come up here, and I can use this mic so that everybody can hear you guys, because the room's kind of big. Um, so 
Kate, I, 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 I want to ask you a question. You said something about that. You think you, you use the word ethical obligation, and this is something you and I talked about yesterday on the phone too, um, to view our work. And we, 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 we talk about viewing our work through a racial lens. Um, and so what I want you to do is talk about what you think that means and why you think as legal services attorneys or poverty law attorneys, however you want to describe us, why we have an ethical obligation to view our work in, in this way. So I think that when we're looking at cases, um, we're all busy, right? We're looking at what our predecessor did and the pleadings that they filed and saying, well, that might fit, you know, for this case that just come in, that came in my door too. Um, but I think you have to push yourself, and I had to push myself and my team to look past what had been done historically. And, and to do the investigation, even if it doesn't mean you necessarily bring a race-based claim, right? It may not be there, but you do the mapping that Kansas showed and Alice showed. You do the data analysis and the legal work to identify if you potentially have claims that you haven't or your predecessors haven't previously considered. I was saying to Jim, my predecessor, Bill Wyland, who was sort of an iconic figure in public housing litigation, uh, filed a, a big um, uh, class action challenging um, the CHA's practices with respect to the Henry Corner Homes over by USC. It's a, it's a great case. It's, it's been talked about for years. It's, it's ongoing. Um, but what is somewhat shocking now as we've developed this practice area is that it did not uh, look at race at all. It did not consider uh, race-based claim. And, and so I think, and I, and I have examples in my own work of that too. And so I think you have to, as you would with any other claim, do that hard work and see if it's available to you and your clients. And in some cases you may decide it's not part of the case that you bring and you file in federal or state court, but it is information you share with your clients and with the community that you're working uh, on behalf of. Um, information that they can bring forward. And there's another campaign that, that I discussed in the PowerPoint with the 525 Task Force, which is attempting to uh, preserve the lost units at the Lathrop Homes and other <coughs> housing development in Chicago. And so they use that information that we put together in the form of a racial impact statement to file an amicus brief in a federal case involving the Lathrop Homes and to use it as part of an organizing effort to agitate the city and the housing authority and HUD and public officials to support their effort to get the replacement housing they believe that they deserve. And so I think as lawyers, we have to sort of force ourselves that this is part of our outline of ensuring that we are fully considering all of the issues on the table before we make a decision on the path the case will take. Uh, all right. So. My next question is for Candice. Um, you, you talked about advocacy that you've been doing with the schools and trainings. Mm -hmm. And what I'd like to know is, when you go into either a school or a group of administrators and you start talking about bias and discipline or you know, specifically within the schools, how receptive are they to your efforts to train on that issue? Yeah, no, I think that's a, a really great question. So I, I will say one, um, in schools, I think we have an opportunity because uh, many, many educators really are, are there for the right reasons and sort of recognize that their job is to educate uh, the students in their buildings. And a lot of times they're frustrated by the inequities that they see, but they feel like they don't have an outlet to talk about it. They don't have the right language to have a conversation. Um, they feel like no one else in the school cares. So in some ways, I feel like when I start this conversation, there's a little bit like, uh-huh, I told y'all. <laughs> um, but that's not to say it's always like that, right? So, um, and it, it's been interesting for me as a person giving the training, the training as a black woman to go into some spaces that are very white, 
um, where I have lots of assumptions about what the community is and um, what it's going to be like and how I'm going to be received and, and still show up and get, be honest and speak my truth and speak the work. Um, I remember a very specific example was uh, I went down to uh, Collinsville, Illinois, which I, I mean, let's just start with, I don't really know a lot of, about many places on the lower part of Illinois, so there's that. And then, and, you know, as being sort of Chicago-based, that there are lots of assumptions about like rural Illinois and what uh, folks' perspectives might be. Um, but I, I went to a training in Collinsville, and it was the week after the election. And um, there was lots going on in my mind about what kind of audience I was gonna have. Um, it was almost exclusively white. Um, and I remember trying to work myself up and I think even right off the, the bat, I just acknowledge uh, a little bit sort of what what we might all be feeling, right? So um, it was, I think I started off with something like, you know, welcome, I, I'm thinking you guys might have some assumptions and uh, about me as a presenter, you might have some anxieties. Here we are about to talk about race. Um, you, want, you might be thinking, what the heck is she gonna say about this? The last time I had a conversation about race, it was really problematic. Um, I actually don't ever wanna have those kinds of conversations again. Um, I'm thinking, oh gosh, here I am in a, in a space when I look out, I see lots of, you know, white people and I'm a black woman and I'm about to talk about race. Um, <laughs> they might have a lot of, you know, uh, concerns about what I might say. I don't want to make these people angry. I don't want folks to uh, leave here uh, feeling upset. And so my goal today is really to try to set up a successful conversation around race. And that's what we're going to do. Um, and we're going to talk about some things, and we're going to learn some things, and I just ask for folks to be open. Um, and I think that was important to set that kind of tone. Um, I, I would say when I did the training, um, I wasn't getting a whole lot. I, I'm, I'm the type of person who I like to crack a little joke, see if people are still awake. Um, I wasn't getting a whole lot. And so after the training, I was a little nervous that it didn't land well. Uh, but when we did the evaluations, and luckily we were there for two days, and we did the evaluations from the first day, the feedback was just incredible. People were so grateful for the conversation. People had such thoughtful things to say, and to me that was such a learning experience about leaning into my discomfort, um, speaking the truth around this, and just daring to have the conversation. And they don't always work out perfectly, but um, I, I don't think you ever regret being honest. Um, being authentic and, and, and speaking truth to power. So. Thanks. All right. I, I would just add to that that I think that these conversations are always going to be uncomfortable. Um, that's just the way that we're wired in this country is that race is a difficult topic to discuss. So, you know, it's really important, like that term that you, or phrase that you just used, lean into your discomfort, I love that, because that's what you have to do. It's not going to, it's never going to be an easy, breezy, wonderful conversation. Sometimes it, hopefully it will often end up there, but that's never going to be the starting out point. So I encourage everyone to go back to their work, to go back to their um, agencies and organizations and think about that and think about the importance of starting out from a place of discomfort, but hopefully ending up in a place where that conversation happens a little more easily. Okay, so this question is for uh, Elise. Um, so just in terms of the practices, right, LEF is a direct service provider, much like Land Lincoln, Prairie State, and a, a bunch of the other agencies. Shriver and Lawyers Committee tend to be, I think it's fair to say, a little more advocacy and bigger group oriented. Um, so we say, how do you find time in our program when we're really involved with direct service? We have pressures about numbers of extended rep cases versus, <coughs> versus advice and brief services cases. So how do you find time when our program's focused on that to investigate and challenge uh, structural racialization when you find it? So that definitely is probably the biggest challenge is when you are trying to balance your high caseload, high volume practice with these larger discussions. 
I mean, I wish I could say it's not just making time for it and carving it out and saying that this is a priority and that it just kind of fits naturally into the work that we're already doing, but it doesn't. It's, it is a active, conscious decision to say, I'm going to carve out this time and it's a priority and talking to the, and getting the backing and support of the folks who are in charge to say that yes, as an agency, as an organization, this part of the work is a priority, is important, and you have my blessing to carve out this time to do the further investigation, to do the further analysis, to do the trainings, the internal trainings and research that's involved. Um, it's a priority for us, and fortunately, um, you know, we work at an organization that says, yes, this is a priority for us, we want it to, it is part of our mission, and so um, you have our blessing to take uh, you know, time from the work that you're already doing and, you know, focus on this to do further analysis, to do trainings, that kind of thing. So I would recommend that people have those discussions and carve out the time because it's worth it. And it will ultimately make your advocacy in your direct services better because you will do the work that Kate was talking about and you will improve your claims. You will make them richer. You will make them stronger. Um, and it will also change the way you look at um, the, the like numbers of cases that you're seeing. You'll start to look for patterns. You'll start to dig into the history, and you'll see if there are you know better claims that you can make. So it's it's a, a time investment, but it's worth it. Yeah, I just wanted to. I, I I have two things that two points to make about that. So what one thing that we did at LAF with the Civil Rights Task Force was. We developed two trainings now that we've made mandatory, uh, that our upper management made mandatory for our staff. So the first was about an hour and a half training on implicit bias, which we've now given for all of our staff and that we now are giving every summer for our uh, law students and interns. Um, and then the second one is a training that is pretty close to this, um, except that we're using five examples and, and instead of the examples that we gave here of the racism, we're using five specific examples from each practice group. Um, and then that will be followed up by a third session. Um, hopefully, it'll be probably in the spring, I think, is when we'll be able to set it up, where then we're going to challenge the individual practice groups to come up with some ideas with the task force's help to try to view their individual practices through a racial lens. Um, the other point I wanted to make was, in my practice, we, um, so in the consumer practice, we deal a lot with home ownership and broker fraud, lending fraud. For years, we had been going up against a mortgage broker who was getting uh, elderly African-American women to basically take out mortgages on their free and clear homes under the pretense that he was going to do work. 30, 40, 50, 60, 80 thousand dollars worth of work, and then do little or no work, and he'd never get seen again. Um, he'd been doing this for decades, and we'd been hitting him on individual cases, individual cases in state court. We struggled to find jurisdiction in federal court. Um, I went to a training similar to this one at the last conference, the last LTF conference. Um, and we started to look for a civil rights claim. And what we found was that he was doing business basically in about an 8 to 12 square block area on the west side of Chicago only. He had never made a loan to a white homeowner. He targeted African-American homeowners for fraud. There is a little part of the case law on fair housing that lets you bring a claim in that situation. And we did so. We survived motions to dismiss. It got the attention of HUD, who did an investigation, and he's now in jail, waiting trial. So through, um, and I can't, I, I cannot take full credit. The, my co-counsel, Michelle Weinberg, who is presenting, I think, next door, she did more than half of the work, because she found him way earlier than I did. Um, but you know, by looking for those claims, we were able to get into federal court where the rules are different. State court, people can skate out of things in state court. Federal court, those judges don't play. I mean, if you, if you can survive your motion to dismiss, if you can survive a 12 v 6 to dismiss, 
you can really, really put their, their feet to the fire. Um, the other thing was our other parties, because we sued everybody. We sued the title companies, we sued the lenders. Those guys have no problem being associated with defrauders. They have a real big problem being associated with racists. Because now we can go to the media and lay that out, lay out what that intent is. And we did kind of that same thing. We told that story about we were able to use the addresses. We had information from the AG. We had, you know, and that's kind of where these relationships across our community can, can really help. I was just going to add to this issue of finding the space to do this work because it is, it's, a, it's an intense amount of work. I'm not going to tell you that it, it isn't. But we, we have developed partnerships on some of our litigation with um, uh, legal service uh, programs. And so in our East Chicago case, which I'll be talking about tomorrow, um, we partnered with Indiana Legal Services. And they really uh, did a fundamental shift in their program. They hired someone from the community to directly work um, on the East Chicago lead crisis and are partnering with us on a daily basis and really responding to the community more directly than they have in years. Um, and, and so we're happy um, to, to talk to any of you about that type of partnership and to lend that type of support. I think it also really speaks to part of doing this work, if it's not clear, is to, is to come from a community luring perspective. You have to be in that community and listening to them and have them drive the work with the information that you provide in order for this to be successful. Any questions? Okay. Yeah, I, I you know, or. Or you can repeat that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I can, okay. Oh, this one will be better. <laughs> I can just come up behind. No, no, that's okay. Here you go. We're committed. Okay. Hi, thank you so much for speaking. Hi, Lisa. Um, can you mention an ethical obligation on our part to look at this historically and in a racial context? And Candace, you talk about walking into these homogenous spaces and talking about implicit bias. But I think also scary and very dangerous is our legal advocacy world and recognizing implicit bias as legal advocates and with our coworkers. So how do you keep that lens focused? Because it's one thing to look at this in historical context, but in order to do so, you have to recognize your own biases as they exist. And as public interest attorneys and advocates, I think we tend to get in this bubble like we're safe, we're in the trenches, we're immune from this. And that's so dangerous. So how do you make sure that your coworkers and yourself that you are accountable for your own biases in this work? So um, I have two things I'll say, and I won't say that this is like the whole answer, right? Um, so one is that I think, so for me, um, learning about implicit bias has been really helpful because one of the challenges that I would have is to be in a space where everyone says they're on the same page around equity, yet we're still producing disparate outcomes, there's problematic things happening, um, and you, I felt like either people are lying to me outright and, or something else is going on. Um, and if I can't figure out that something else, then I'm just really frustrated, I'm really upset, I feel like this is something I can't be a part of. And so once I, once I learned about implicit bias, it gave me a frame in which to think about what might be happening, not in total, but uh, maybe to account for some of this, these blinders I thought people had and these walls that folks had up when you wanted to criticize them. And so I use implicit bias, I have to often talk about it as an on-ramp to really begin to acknowledge our responsibility in this work, regardless of where you start, regardless of how well you think you're aligned with equity. Um, we all have implicit biases, and the sooner we recognize that, the sooner we can get to work. 
um, mm -hmm. and that we all have a responsibility to continue to learn and check ourselves and check our biases. And when people come to us and, and, and say things have happened, this is an opportunity for us to do an analysis of ourselves and talk about what can we do differently. And maybe I did do something that I did not intend to do, but it still had this outcome. Right, so that's been really important to me. Um, the other thing is I think it's important to be in community with other lawyers who can encourage you <laughs> when the road gets tough. This is a shameless plug yes. for, <laughs> for I Care, the Illinois um, Community of Advocates for Race Equity, um, which uh, came out of the Shriver's Racial Justice Training Institute, but it was our capstone project because we wanted to make sure we were building a community across Illinois that could learn together, talk about these issues together, build together, influence our organizations together. Um, and so my shameless plug is that all y'all should sign up for I Care and stay connected because that community is going to be really important because sometimes you can't move or you can't think about something in isolation in your organization because there's all sorts of barriers, but to connect with someone in a different organization can give you different ideas, can give you different strategies, can just give you a little bit of encouragement to believe that this work is still moving and that you should be moving with it. So, Kate said we have the Racial Justice Training Institute at Shriver, but the truth is, I'm in a safe space, right? We haven't dealt with implicit bias within our own staff. I mean, so the Shriver Center is just going through that process now. So, we train it, we train on implicit bias, we talk to programs and advise them on what to do, but we hadn't dealt with it internally ourselves and quite frankly it came to a head in the last year and a half and so we started a training in December which is ongoing and we now have a race equity committee but I mean I would say we're behind LAF we're behind the lawyers committee we're behind others it's a constant that you have to work at all the time and you have to have buy-in from the top of your organization to do it and that was another thing that we learned through our JTI is that initially the training really was targeting new attorneys. And so we were teaching new attorneys on RJTI and implicit bias. They're coming back to their institutions, which at the top look almost exclusively white, right? And saying, we want to do this. We need to address these hard issues. And, and those institutions were saying, what are you talking about? This is how we've done legal aid, we're not biased, we're in the trenches, we care about these issues. And so now we've gone back and grabbed those executive directors and put them into trainings. And now as our cohorts move, move forward, we really make sure we have leaders from those organizations as part of the training because we have to have a shift within each institution to make this work. I'm just gonna add a couple really quick um, ideas that we've done at LAF. Um, we have done the implicit bias training, as Jim was saying. Um, we also um, have, as part of our, um, we have several heritage um, celebrations that we do, uh, like this one that we're coming up in September, October is for uh, Latinx heritage. And as part of all of each of those heritage celebrations, we take a look internally at LAF, at our structure, at, and um, that accountability piece I think is also really important. We look at what we look like internally and we look like at what the community that we're serving and how, what is that comparison? How does that look? Um, so we have those difficult internal conversations um, integrated in some other maybe less threatening or, or you know, less aggressive or assertive contexts. Like we're saying, this is something that we as an agency are celebrating, but let's also take a look internally because that's a really important step. Um, we also, as part, of, as Jim was saying, as part of the Civil Rights Task Force, this is something that you know we've gotten executive buy-in to say this is a part of our work, and we need to be supportive of that. And so that's also a space where we can have some of those difficult conversations, where we can be supportive. Uh, and of each other, this is the same way that Candace was talking about, and I will also say the uh, second her plug for eye care, because that is another space where we can have really motivational 
um, uplifting conversations of I'm not the only one who's trying to do this work. There is a whole entire community of people who are out there, and here are some tips, and here are ideas, or here's just like a pat on the back for you're not in this alone, and that's really important for that self-care piece that you were talking about. Anyone, anyone else want to ask a question? Microphone. Um, I have a question for the panel. She talked a little bit about some of the racial anxiety that's associated with doing this type of work and taking these types of cases. Can any of you offer any tips to advocates or to administrators in the room to help prepare their staff for some of the microaggression that comes when you engage in this work and handle these cases and really confront some of these issues? A way to prepare for that. I don't know that there's a way to prepare for that other than just to say and expect this. You know, it's the, this is a we're saying this is an important part of our work, and we're going to engage in these like what we were saying earlier, uncomfortable conversations, and that is going to have some fallout. Some of that fallout might be, you know, what you're talking about, like different interactions, interper interpersonal interactions, um, same things that same things that you were talking about. So I think just acknowledging that. Um, and another, I think, tip that we do with our implicit bias training is before we do the implicit bias training, we ask everybody to take uh, the implicit association tests. So there's a website um, called Project Implicit. It's an organization through Harvard University. Um, and that the first test is one that is completely um, non-controversial. It's an implicit association test, whether you like bugs or do you prefer flowers to bugs. And it gets people thinking that this implicit bias thing is an actual real thing. It's not um, something that's made up. It doesn't mean that I am an explicit racist. Even people who are in the struggle working at you know these organizations, um, it, so it lets you a little bit off the hook of saying this is not something I'm consciously doing. These are things that are pre-wired in my brain, and I have to work to overcome them. And that I think can help with that conversation of. It's not, I'm not attacking you as a person individually, but these are things that we all need to work at and we need to work through. So that is one kind of practical tip, is um, having people do that implicit association test and having them do all of them and, and having that maybe be a, a place to start the conversations and then like, you know, preparing people for that. There's gonna be some fallout from these uncomfortable conversations. I would just say, uh, at least also, you, you had said one time in one of the trainings that you should revisit the test too. Yeah. Right? So even if you have done them, that you need to periodically review them because that helps you to realize that that, that bias exists. You can't, you can't just make it disappear, mm -hmm. right? Because it's coming from everything around you that you're reading or seeing. Um, something that I think about as one that there's no perfect way to do this. Um, so uh, sometimes I hear people say, oh, like you're the expert on this. And I'm like, no, you have no idea. Um, someone just told me about it, so I'm just telling other people. And I'm like, we're all honest about that. Um, so there's no perfect way to do this. You might mess up, and that's OK, right? Um, you might need to learn some things, go back to the shop. You tried, you tried it. You got you know some feedback that something weren't so effective. So go back to the shop and try it again. Um, I have uh, sometimes when I'm doing trainings, I would say one tip is that I come to it from this idea of I want us to figure this out. Um, I'm going to give you some of the knowledge that I have, but the real solution here is what we come up with collectively. And so let me just help you facilitate this conversation, um, which one takes the pressure off of me. But I think that's real, um, is that it, it works best when people are processing this, when people are thinking about how this applies in their own lives, when people are able to con feel like they can continue to have conversations after you leave, you're not solving it for anyone, you're giving them a tool in which to continue the work and continue conversations. Um, and then, yeah, just, it sounds kind of funny, but like be humble, be humble about um, this experience you're about to go through, but you, you it's a responsibility. Um, it's what your clients are asking for, 
right? Um, what it can mean to a client to hear you confirm what they know, they've lived every single day, but everyone has told them it's not that. When they hear come to you and you say, actually, this is what's going on, you're not crazy. Um, what that can do, what win or lose for a client is, is, is huge. And so know that even all of these things that you might be trying to tackle, whether it's with the judge or with the audience that you're talking to, that at, at, at the very least for your clients, it matters and it's really important to that. And I would just say, because we're, again, we're going through this now at, at Shriver, um, people do get defensive. And they're saying, Did I, does this mean that all of my work was terrible, mm -hmm. right, or unethical? Um, and, you know, does this mean I didn't do good work and didn't help people? Of course you did great work and you did help people, but we need to all learn to do better and to do more and to use what we learned in law school, apply these principles to look to see if there are, in this case, racial disparities or structural racialization. And, and so part of it is that we've tried to I've heard, and I've heard people say, well, it's only in housing. Race, race discrimination is only an issue in housing. That, I hear that a lot, too. But I think it is, we, what we've really tried to do is give people the tools. Like, OK, we did a mapping training at Shriver a month ago. And so we had an AmeriCorps VISTA train the entire staff on how to map um, as part of their project period. And so our hope is as we give people the tools the sort of defensiveness that's coming with the introduction of applying a race equity lens to the work will fall away. Because that we're better advocates, and and really, what Candace said, we are we are uh, doing so much more for our clients. And I and I've had that same experience where I validate what a client believes, um, and and sometimes it's almost overwhelming to them because they didn't ever had someone acknowledge what was actually happening. Um, so we have about five minutes. Is there another? <laughs> so maybe this is going to be gasoline on the fire at five minutes to end, but I, I, I'd like to know your thoughts on how do you meaningfully sort of incorporate this into our agencies when you look across the landscape of legal services and at the executive level, it looks the same. It's white and it's privileged. <laughs> you can answer that in five minutes. <laughs> Well, one thing that has been really important for me is to make white folks understand that this is their work. This is the work. This is what has to be done. Um, uh, and because I think sometimes there's this tension with this idea that you know it's just people of color who should lead this work. Um, let's talk about diversity. Let's make sure we get the people of color to 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 tell us what needs to happen. And to me, whether it's through implicit bias or just through conversations, it's really getting people to understand that when you sign up for this work around poverty, you are talking about the work around race. Like, you, you're not gonna get where you want to go if you don't deal with it. This is a part of your mission, whether it says it explicitly or not. This is the work you signed up for. Um, and I think, so I think one is trying to get folks to understand that. I think uh, leadership, one of the tactics that we talked about in eye care is this idea of convincing them that everybody else is doing it but them. Um, <laughs> the work is happening, the movement is happening, you need to be a part of it. And because we're across multiple organizations, we could point to, well, the Chicago Lawyers Committee did that, and guess what, they got a grant for it, right? And that attracts <laughs> leadership as well. Um, and, you know, uh, or LAF is doing it and they're getting all of this great work out of it. So a little friendly competition that I've heard. Um, I think that can compel folks. But then just having this idea of figuring out, like, 
small spaces to just start, set examples. If you can get someone to at least say, well, I don't know about the whole organization yet, but you can do that with your practice area. Start, start, right? And then use that as a model to try to grow. Because guess what, if that practice area begins killing it, right? Like Elise showed able to access more Spanish speaking clients than other than the organization as a whole, all of a sudden there's, there's a question of how did you do that? What are you doing differently? So I think that can support it as well. But but really getting people to buy and I think that's why training is key and to start with those conversations and, and get everyone on the same page that this is the work we signed up for. This is our responsibility. We have to do it and, and we're gonna make it happen. So I think that helps. We, so we went through a strategic planning process in the last year and, and agreed that we would apply a race justice lens to every aspect, every project within the Shriver Center. And some are far ahead and some are far behind. And so now it will be part of work planning, uh, which will start uh, in the next month where the directors and the advocacy staff have to specifically say what they are going to do to move applying this lens forward, and they will be accountable to that. But that came from a commitment uh, from the board and, and from the senior management team to move that forward. And so it really is about getting, I, I can't say this enough because it really was a failure initially of our JTI not to include senior teams. You have to get their buy-in from the top. And then I guess I, I would just add that I think part of it is growing diversity within your organizations, growing that leadership, providing <coughs> internal structures of mentorship and leadership and other opportunities for people who look different than the way our um, executive boards and uh, board members look now so that you know this is not a sprint it's a marathon it's going to take a long time but we know we're on the right path and we're doing the work that needs to be done so I think eventually the land just the way you know the landscape is going to change and there will be different voices at that table especially if we put into place all of the things that we're talking about we are on time so.